In this video, we will delve into two chilling stories that have captivated audiences and raised unsettling questions about the human capacity for deception and the pursuit of justice. Prepare yourself for a journey into the dark and perplexing world of Rachel Timmerman and the enigmatic circumstances surrounding Betsy Faria and Louis Gumpenberger. 1. Rachel Timmerman On a warm summer day in 1997, two fishermen saw something floating on Oxford Lake, near Cedar Springs, Michigan. As they neared the object, they realized it was a human body. The body, which had significantly decayed, appeared to be of a young female. Her hands were handcuffed behind her back, she had duct tape over her mouth and eyes, and she was chained to a few cinder blocks. The body had been in the water quite some time but had risen to the surface after filling with gas from the natural decaying process of the human body. Who was she and how did this girl end up at the bottom of Lake Oxford? Rachel Helena Timmerman was born April 6, 1978. Rachel's parents were divorced. She and her siblings were raised primarily by their father. Her parents suffered a few tragic incidents including the loss of a baby due to SIDS and the loss of their youngest child, born with special needs, in Rachel struggled a little in school and was bullied. When she was 17, Rachel became pregnant by a guy she had dated only briefly. While she was pregnant, she was arrested for a minor possession of marijuana charge and given probation. On June 15, 1996, Rachel gave birth to a daughter, Shannon Dale Verge. In August of 1996, Rachel decided to hang out with some friends. Mikey Gabrian and Wayne Davis, acquaintances of hers. Wayne and Mikey picked her up, along with Mikey's uncle Marvin Gabrian. The group headed to play cards and Rachel looked forward to a night out, something she hadn't had much of since she became a mother. The four played cards and enjoyed the night, but eventually decided they needed more beer. Marvin, Mikey, Wayne, and Rachel piled into Marvin's vehicle and headed out. Along the way, Marvin pulled over and ordered Mikey and Wayne out of the car. He then drove Rachel to a secluded area where he attacked her. Rachel was raped, beat, Marvin bit her nose so hard it left a bleeding wound. Rachel eventually stopped fighting, out of fear that Marvin would kill her. After the attack, Marvin drove her back to her father's house, where she was living with her infant daughter. Rachel ran inside, locked the door, and grabbed a hammer to defend herself. She told her sister what happened and that she was terrified of Marvin. Rachel was so terrified of Marvin that she didn't initially want to report the sexual assault to the police. Her sister convinced her to come forward so that no one else would have to go through what Rachel had gone through. Rachel went to the hospital the next morning for a sexual assault examination and told the authorities what happened. Police confirmed at least the first part of the story with Wayne Davis, who confirmed that Marvin made him get out of the vehicle. Police then went to talk to Marvin Gabrian. Marvin Gabrian refused to cooperate with authorities or be questioned about the accusations. He did, however, fax the police his account of the night Rachel was attacked. In Marvin's version of the story, Rachel offered to give Marvin oral sex. Marvin said that is why he kicked the other men out of the vehicle. He admitted to going to a secluded area and stated that Rachel gave him oral sex and then placed the ejaculate inside of herself. Marvin then stated that Rachel begged him to have intercourse with him, but he refused. The vehicle got stuck in the mud, according to Marvin, and Rachel helped push it out. That explained why she was dirty, he said. He said that she hurt herself while pushing the car, causing the injuries noted to her face and other bruises found on her body. He said Rachel was lying because she was mad that he had rejected her. Police did not believe Marvin Gabrian's version of events. Wayne Davis supported Rachel's version. The police also noted that in his version, he tried to account for any evidence that may have been collected. However, it was not a logical story. Marvin Gabrian was served in February of 1997 with an arrest warrant for the sexual assault of Rachel Timmerman. The witnesses on the warrant included Rachel Timmerman and Wayne Davis. Marvin was taken into custody but posted bond while awaiting trial. Rachel was in jail however, serving a short sentence in county jail for a probation violation. 
Marvin Charles Gabrion was born October 18, 1953. He was one of six children in a house plagued with mental illness, mental and physical abuse, poverty, substance abuse, and violence. According to his family, Marvin helped elderly family members and provided care for a family member with mental disabilities. He had very superior intelligence including an IQ of 121, Agar, 2017. He grew up as a loner and after high school, he began a troubled adult life plagued by mental illness and drug abuse. Gabriel had been in and out of jail throughout his adult life for multiple offenses. In late May, Rachel was released from jail and living back with her father. She was trying to get her life in order for her daughter, Shannon. Shannon was living with her paternal grandparents while Rachel was in jail, but Rachel was determined to get things back on track so she could have Shannon with her all the time. After her release, Rachel saw Marvin a few times around town. He would threaten her and generally try to scare her. He told her that he would kill her baby in front of her and then kill her. Rachel was terrified. She was set to testify against Marvin in court on June 5, 1997. On June 3, 1997, Rachel informed her father and sister that she was going out on a date. She said she had met a man named John at work. She was excited about meeting up with John. Rachel wasn't sure how many men would want to date a 19-year-old single mother with an almost one-year-old, but John seemed up for it. In fact, he seemed excited. He urged Rachel to bring Shannon with her on their first date. He wanted to meet her daughter. Rachel got Shannon ready, hugged her dad, and left walked out the door. She got into the car with a man, presumably John, but her family did not really get a close look at him. A few days after her date with John, Rachel had failed to return home or to Shannon's grandparents' home where the infant lived part of the time. Her family was growing concerned, but they soon received a letter from Rachel. Her father said the letter was certainly in her handwriting, and she often wrote letters to him. The letter said she had met the man of her dreams, a guy she called Delbert, and they were eloping. She said she would be back in Michigan in a few weeks. It was a little odd, especially since the man she left with was named John. Two days later, the court hearing for Marvin Gabriel happened, but Rachel did not show up. Neither did the state's other witness, Wayne Davis. The judge and prosecutor soon received handwritten letters from Rachel, confirmed to be in her handwriting, stating that she was now living in Arkansas and married to a Christian man. She said that this marriage forced her to confront the truth about the night she was with Marvin. She said she had made the whole story up because she was angry at Marvin. She admitted to placing his ejaculate from oral sex inside of herself in order to frame with for sexual assault. She said she couldn't live with herself if an innocent man went to prison. The state dropped the charges against Marvin Gabriel. Rachel's family received another letter stating she was living in Arkansas and was planning to stay there with her husband, Delbert, and daughter Shannon. On July 5, 1997, fishermen noticed something in the water on Oxford Lake in rural Nuego County, Michigan. As their boat got closer, they realized it was a human body. Upon finding the body, authorities realized that the skin was already sloughing off of the victim. They needed the skin from her fingers to identify her. They decided to place a trampoline mat underneath the body and elevate the body inside the mat. The trampoline strained the water, but the skin remained attached to the body. Once the medical examiner was able to carefully remove the sloughing skin from the fingers, a fingerprint was obtained. This matched to someone in the police records, 19-year-old Rachel Timmerman. Police notified Rachel's family of her death. If that wasn't hard enough, they learned during this notification that Shannon, a one-year-old infant, was missing and last seen June 3rd with her mother. Authorities had a new sense of urgency as they tried to locate the missing child. A search of Oxford Lake and the surrounding national forest yielded no clues as to the whereabouts of baby Shannon. The medical examiner determined Rachel's cause of death was drowning. Rachel had been chained and padlocked to cedar blocks with reddish paint noted on them. Her eyes and mouth were duct taped, but her nose was not. She had been in the water approximately a month, so authorities were quite sure she died on June 3rd, the day she left with Shannon for her date. 
Police began searching for a man named John but didn't have much else to identify the man who had picked her up. Police suspected Marvin Gabrion, who clearly benefited from Rachel's death, was connected to the crime. However, family members said there was no way Rachel would have gotten into the car with Marvin that day. Police went to Marvin's home to question him about Rachel's murder. He was not home, but in his yard were cinder blocks with reddish paint on them, very similar to those found with Rachel's body. This was enough for a search warrant of his home. Inside, police found a key that matched one of the padlocks found with Rachel as well as duct tape and chains similar to what had been used to bind Rachel. What they hadn't found, however, was Marvin Gabrion. Witnesses came forward indicating that Marvin Gabrion and another man had been seen on his boat on Oxford Lake on June 3, 1997. Marvin had also allegedly asked someone to store his boat at their campsite, saying his site was too small. However, it was ample size to store the boat. The man with Marvin that day was identified as John Weeks. When police went to his home, they learned from his girlfriend that John hadn't been in town for a while, and she hadn't heard from him. Last she saw him was early June, when he told her he was going to Texas with Marvin Gabrion to buy drugs. He never came back from that trip. Marvin told her that he dropped John off in Arizona with friends. By October of 1997, Marvin Gabrion was wanted for failure to appear on a drunk driving charge in Michigan. He was a wanted man. The FBI received a tip that Marvin Gabrion was picking up social security checks regularly from a post office in Sherman, New York. The social security checks were written to a man named Robert Allen, who detectives soon learned had been missing since 1995. His social security checks, however, continued to be cashed. The FBI did a stake out at the post office, waiting for Gabrion. Marvin came to pick up a check and was taken into federal custody. At first, Marvin was only charged with social security fraud. He went to trial for that charge in July of 1998. He was found guilty and sentenced to five years in federal prison. Meanwhile, police continued to look for witnesses such as Wayne Davis and John Meeks but were unable to locate them. They built a strong case before officially charging Marvin Gabrion with the first-degree murder of Rachel Timmerman in June of 1999. The state of Michigan, however, was not trying Gabrion. Oxford Lake, or at least the portion of it where Rachel's body was found, is part of the Manistee National Forest, therefore under federal jurisdiction. The United States of America was trying Marvin Gabrion and seeking the death penalty. Michigan abolished the death penalty in 1846, making it the first English-speaking jurisdiction to do so. This trial would be a landmark case because it is the first case to seek the death penalty for a crime committed in a non-death penalty state since the federal government reinstated capital punishment in 1988. Gabrion's attorneys, however, argued that part of the lake is private property, and the prosecution could not prove the murder occurred on federal property. The murder trial for Marvin Gabrion began in 2002. During the trial, Marvin's behavior was disruptive and erratic. At one point, he punched his own defense attorney in the face during open court. Many believe this was purposeful in order to create doubt about his mental health. That being said, seven psychologists found him competent to stand trial. Prior to the closure of the trial, prosecutors offered Gabriel a deal at Rachel's family's insistence, they would not seek the death penalty if Marvin would tell them what happened to baby Shannon. Marvin declined the deal. Marvin was found guilty of first-degree murder. At the sentencing portion of his trial, the defense team pointed to a history of abuse, substance abuse, mental illness, and multiple head injuries as mitigating factors. The aggravating factors, however, were strong. Marvin was accused of sexual assault of Rachel nearly a year before the murder, was already in prison for social security fraud, and had a criminal history a mile long. The mitigating evidence was not enough to outweigh the brutality of the crime. Marvin Gabrion was sentenced to death. He is the first person sentenced to death in the state of Michigan since 1937. Shannon Verhage is considered a missing person to this day, over 25 years after she disappeared. It has been theorized that Marvin may have sold the baby, 
but law enforcement officers and detectives who work this case believe that Shannon is likely deceased. They believe that Marvin convinced his friend John Meeks to ask Rachel out and insisted she bring her baby. It is believed that Marvin used baby Shannon in order to convince Rachel to write the letters that were sent later to her family and the court. Detectives believe that he then killed Shannon in front of Rachel just to torture her. Rachel was then thrown in the lake, while still alive, and left to drown. Marvin surely thought the cinder blocks would be enough to weigh Rachel's body down, but the gases of decomposition overpowered the weights. In 2002, the body of Wayne Davis was found in Twinwood Lake, inside the same national forest that Rachel was found. Police knew Gabrion had attempted to pawn Wayne's stereo in 1997, shortly after he disappeared, but had no other conclusive evidence to tie into Wayne Davis's death. He has never been charged. John Weeks, the man Marvin convinced to lure Rachel out of the house with her baby, has never been found. He is a missing person to this day. Robert Allen, whose social security checks Gabrion was cashing for two years after he had disappeared, has never been found either. Marvin is suspected to have killed Rachel, Shannon, Wayne, John, and Robert. Likely, he killed even more. Each of his victims were just collateral damage as he tried to cover his tracks and stay out of prison for his crimes. Marvin Gabrion remains on federal death row as of 2022. We have come to the end of our first story. Before the second story begins, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you liked the video. Now we move on to another story. Just two days after Christmas in 2011, Russell Faria made a 911 call at approximately 9.40 p.m. to report that he just found his wife, Elizabeth Betsy Faria, dead on the living room floor. The man sobbed as he told the dispatcher that his wife had killed herself. However, upon arrival at the home in Troy, Missouri, authorities quickly realized Betsy Faria had not committed suicide. She was stabbed several times and had a knife protruding from her neck. Betsy had been brutally murdered and police immediately suspected her husband. No one could have predicted the long winding road this case would take or the unimaginable revelations that would come to light. This is a story of deadly games. Betsy Faria and Louis Gumpenberger Elizabeth Betsy Meyer was born March 24, 1969, to Kenneth and Judy Meyer of Richmond Heights, Missouri. Betsy was in a long-term relationship with a man she never married and together they had two daughters, Leah and Mariah. However, the couple split when the girls were little. Betsy then married her second husband, but that relationship ended after about a year. Betsy was working at a gas station after her marriage ended when she began a mutual flirtation with a frequent customer, Russell Faria. Betsy had her own DJ business and Russ described her as the party starter. It didn't matter if she was working or not, if she went to a party, or gathering, or get together, she'd get everybody up playing games or getting people up dancing, Saderstrom, 2022. Russ began to help her with the business, and they married in 2000. Russell became a father figure for Leah and Mariah. Russ and Betsy liked to go camping, play volleyball, and visit local bars. Betsy enjoyed playing board games. When Betsy began working at an insurance office during the day, she met co-worker Pam Hupp. Betsy and Pam became friends, but after Pam was terminated from the position, the two drifted apart. However, Pam made efforts to rekindle the friendship in 2010 when Betsy was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her initial treatment included a mastectomy and chemotherapy, which seemed successful. Betsy and Russ were told the cancer was gone, but that changed by 2011. In 2011, Russ and Betsy learned that the cancer was back and had spread to her liver. Betsy was terminally ill and would not survive cancer. However, she continued to fight and was receiving chemotherapy treatments. A month before her death, Betsy and Russ went on a cruise with a group of their friends to celebrate her life. On December 26, Russ and Betsy attended a family Christmas party. Some of Betsy's family stated she seemed down, but others said that the couple seemed perfectly normal. In fact, many said they were happier than they had been in quite some time. The Faria marriage was not exactly picture-perfect. 
Russ and Betsy had both had affairs and had split on numerous occasions. Betsy's teenage daughters had moved out of the Faria home and in with relatives, which may have been a result of arguments between Betsy and Russ. On December 27th, Betsy went to St. Louis for her chemotherapy treatment. Her friend, Pam Hupp, had planned to go with Betsy that day. However, a family friend Bobby Wan was visiting Betsy's mother from Texas. Betsy texted Pam and told her not to come to the chemotherapy appointment because she wanted to spend some time with Bobby. Pam texted back Bummer, Schwartz and Bosworth. However, Pam Hupp did come to that chemotherapy session, inserting herself into Betsy's life. When the chemotherapy session ended, Betsy went back to her mother's home near the hospital to rest and spend time with her family. Her daughters, mother, and family friend Bobby enjoyed board games and just spending time together. Betsy planned to stay with her mother that night, but Pam insisted she would come back to St. Louis to get Betsy after she fed her husband and son. Pam drove to O'Fallon, Missouri, to go home and then back to St. Louis an hour or so later. It seemed out of the way and inconvenient, but Pam said Betsy needed her. At approximately 7.04 p.m., Pam and Betsy pulled into Betsy's driveway. Pam called her husband Mark and left a message on his voicemail. Betsy even said hi to Mark on that message. Pam left Betsy a voicemail at approximately 7.27 p.m. telling Betsy she was home. Betsy's daughter had told her mother she would call her at approximately 7.20 p.m., which she did, but those calls went unanswered. Pam would later call Betsy's mother, concerned about her friend. Pam said Betsy wanted her to stay and hang out, but Pam had to leave. She was fearful that her friend was upset with her. Only, her friend was dead on the living room floor. When brought in for questioning, Russ explained that he left work that Tuesday at approximately 5 p.m. He texted Betsy, who informed him Pam was bringing her home. He then went to a gas station to get two iced teas, a grocery store to get dog food, and another gas station to buy a carton of cigarettes. He called his mother to tell her he wouldn't be at her house for their weekly dinner because he had gained night. He and a small group of friends got together regularly to play a role-playing game similar to Dungeons and Dragons. Russ explained he was at his friend's home playing games and watching movies until approximately 9 p.m. Russ had been smoking marijuana with some of his friends that night and needed to satisfy a craving. On his way home he stopped at Arby's and ordered two Junior Cheddar Melts, eating them on the way home. He drove approximately 25 miles to his home. When he walked inside and sat the dog food down, he spotted Betsy's body. Hysterical, he called 911. Police believed his hysteria was over the top and possibly not sincere. Their suspicions grew when Russ stated Betsy had killed herself. The first responders that arrived found the body of Betsy Faria with several stab wounds and a knife sticking out of her neck. There was no way she had committed suicide. Betsy had been stabbed 55 times. She had perforations to her lungs, liver, and spleen. There were deep punctures inflicted upon her after her death. It was a bloody crime scene and a brutal murder. First responders noted Betsy was already somewhat stiff and some of the blood had coagulated, indicating she likely had been killed a few hours before police arrived at 9.55 p.m. When police told Russ that Betsy was murdered, he became even more hysterical. He explained that Betsy had terminal cancer and a history of suicide attempts. However, the police were not buying that and thought Russ was hiding something. They questioned him for over 24 hours and gave him a polygraph. Police told him he failed his polygraph, but Russ insisted he was telling the truth. He had a timestamp receipt still in his car from Arby's along with one of the iced teas and his cigarette carton. Video footage at the convenience and grocery stores confirmed his whereabouts. Four friends corroborated Russ's alibi as they had been with him from 6 to 9 p.m. on game night. At the scene, a pair of bloody slippers were found in Russ's closet and smeared blood on the light switch in the bedroom. Russ swore he never went to the bedroom, but police believed he was lying. Forensic evidence on the slippers determined the blood was that of Betsy Faria and skin cells with Russell's DNA were found inside the slippers. 
Police also thought they figured out Russ's motive when they spoke to Pam Hupp. Pam Hupp said she was Betsy's best friend. She told authorities that she didn't know Russ well, but Betsy was afraid of Russ. According to Pam, Russ was mean and belittled Betsy all the time. The longer authorities talked to Pam, the more depraved the stories became. She told cops that Russell had placed a pillow over Betsy's face more than once and told her he wanted her to know what it would feel like to die. Pam said Betsy told her about an email Betsy had written to her but said Betsy must not have sent it. She said Betsy was scared of her husband and was avoiding him. She said the house was only in Russ's name and Russ was making comments about how much money he would have when Betsy died. See, Betsy had life insurance. Betsy Faria had approximately $300,000 in life insurance policies and Russell believed he was the beneficiary on those policies. However, for days before Betsy died, she changed the beneficiary on one of her policies, totaling $150,000, to her friend Pam Hupp. According to Pam, Betsy was afraid Russ would be irresponsible with the money and wanted Pam to make sure her daughters received the money. Authorities contacted newly elected state's attorney Leah Askey about their suspicions and the evidence. On January 4, 2012, Russell Faria was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action, Cooperman, 2017. Russell retained Joel Schwartz as his defense attorney. His attorney quickly realized there were a lot of problems with this case. He couldn't believe how little evidence the prosecution had and how weak that evidence was. Should be easy enough to acquit, right? After all, Russ could easily prove the house was in Betsy's name too and Pam had as much motive as Russ to kill Betsy. When Russ went to trial, Leah Askey, in her first murder trial, led the prosecution. The judge, Christina Menemeyer, was also new to her role and this was her first time presiding over a murder trial. Judge Menemeyer and prosecutor Askey had gone to high school together, but that wasn't uncommon in the small Lincoln County community. Joel Schwartz was experienced and ready. He was prepared, but the judge made a ruling that would change everything. In preparation for Russ's trial, Joel Schwartz had confirmed his rock-solid alibi. Russ would have had 23 minutes to drive 20 miles, kill Betsy, shower, clean up the scene, and dial 911. The Arby's receipt was stamped at 9.09 p.m., indicating that is when he made the order. He called 911 at 9.41 p.m. When they took Russ's clothing, the same clothing he was wearing on video after work while running errands, they found not one speck of blood. There was no way Russ could be the killer, and that was reasonable doubt enough. Joel had also requested the results and video of the polygraph examination but learned there was no record or recording of the examination. He also requested the photos of the crime scene as police stated that there was a positive luminol reaction in the kitchen and on the cabinet front of the drawer where the towels were kept. Leah Askey, the prosecutor, told the defense that there were no photographs because the camera had malfunctioned. The investigators would be allowed to testify that there had been a reaction to the luminol, however. Joel then listened to the video recordings of police interviews with Pam Hupp in the nearly two years between the murder and the start of the trial. Pam first told authorities she dropped Betsy off at 7.04 when she made the call to Mark and never went in the house. She later admitted she went into the house and said Betsy was on the couch when she left. She said the call at 7.27 p.m. was to tell Betsy she was home, but that would have been impossible for Pam to drive from Troy to O'Fallon that quickly. She changed her story and said she was just outside of Troy when she made the call because she didn't want Betsy to worry. Joel had his doubts and hired an expert to track the cell phone calls made by Pam. According to his expert, Pam was within three miles of Betsy's house when she made the call at 7.27 p.m., proving Pam was lying. She told so many different stories and her stories became more and more incriminating to Russ as time went on. Joel realized Pam was the last person to see Betsy alive and was in the area when Betsy had been killed. He believed Russ's best defense was to point the finger at Pam Hupp, who he truly believed to be a viable suspect. The police had talked to Pam several times and spoke to Pam's husband, although they conducted that interview in Pam's presence.
Pam had received the $150,000 from Betsy's life insurance already as the police confirmed she was not a suspect in the case. Shortly before the trial began, a Lincoln County police officer told Pam to put the money in a trust for Leah and Mariah Day before the trial or it may look bad. They even suggested that she may have seen less the night of the murder, which Pam later said she may have. No one ever really investigated Pam Hop's whereabouts or clothing. After all, she was not a suspect. She even told the police that if she wanted money, she would be getting a half million dollars when her mother dies, so why would she try to kill Betsy who was stronger than her? Leah Askey asked Judge Christina Menemeyer to disallow testimony about the insurance policy that Betsy had changed the beneficiary to Pam Hop four days before her murder and to disallow a defense that pointed at Pam Hop because she claimed there was no direct evidence. Unbelievably, the judge agreed. Joel Schwartz was not allowed to mention the insurance policy or ask any questions that suggested Pam Hop may be the killer. This trial was crazy. Leah Askey, the prosecutor, presented the evidence that Russell Faria would gain financially through the insurance policies if Betsy died. Schwartz objected as the insurance policies were already ruled inadmissible. The judge overruled him stating it went to motive but continued to deny the defense from using that motive to point the finger at Pam Hupp. The biggest pieces of evidence included testimony about the luminal reactions although there were no pictures, the number of stab wounds, Russ's suggestion that Betsy had killed herself, and finally those bloody slippers. Finally, the prosecution called Pam Hupp to the stand, and she told the jury about Russ's abusive behavior and Betsy's fear of Russ, including the pillow incident. The defense claimed the luminal reactions weren't significant because none of the samples obtained from those reactions actually contained human blood, which the pathologist confirmed. Furthermore, there weren't any photos to even prove there was a reaction. The number of stab wounds was brutal, but the medical examiner believed several were inflicted after Betsy died and possibly to make the murder look more viscous. The defense had Betsy's own family and daughters, who had turned against Russ, testify about Betsy's history of suicidal behavior and diagnosis of terminal cancer. And then those slippers, the blood on those slippers looked as if the slippers had been dipped in blood. There was no blood on the bottom of the slippers and no bloody footprints in the house. It was true that Russ's DNA was inside the slippers, but they were Russ's slippers and he had worn them many times. The blood on the light switch had no fingerprints or DNA other than Betsy's and looked like a smear. There was absolutely no blood found in any of the home's sinks, showers, or plumbing. The showers and sinks were dry, not indicative of a cleanup effort. Pam Hupp claimed her changes to her stories were related to her disability, foot drop and balance issues, and a previous head injury. However, she claimed that she was sure that Betsy was alive when she left and sure Betsy was afraid of Russ. She said Betsy changed the life insurance to her December 23rd because she didn't want Russ to blow the money after she died of cancer. She suggested that Russ found out and went into a rage, killing Betsy. Every time the defense tried to ask questions to show Pam Hupp was an unreliable witness, the prosecution objected and the judge sustained, limiting the questioning. In her closing statement, Leah Askey presented a theory that Russ Faria and his friends wanted to play the ultimate role-playing game and had been planning Betsy's murder for months, maybe even years. She said his friends lied about his alibi and likely assisted him by carrying his phone around, explaining why the cell phone records corroborated Russ's story and alibi. She even accused Russ of sexually assaulting his wife, for which there was no proof. The defense was disgusted. Not only had the judge barred them from presenting Pam Hop as an alternate suspect due to lack of evidence, but the judge allowed Askey to point the finger at four people as co-conspirators with absolutely no evidence. In a shocking upset, the jury in Lincoln County found Russell Faria guilty of first-degree murder and armed criminal action in the death of Betsy Faria. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Joel Schwartz was not done, however, and vowed to pursue an appeal based on the ridiculous rulings in this case and the unethical behavior of the prosecution. In the meantime, Russ went to prison. Shortly after Russ's conviction, Pam Hopp revoked the trust in Betsy's daughter's names and transferred all but $300 to her checking account. 
This would result in a civil suit between Leah and Mariah Day and Pamela Hopp. There was no proof, however, of Betsy's intentions with the money, so Pam won the case and was not required to give any money to Betsy's daughters. She had only set the trust up because the police suggested it would help in the case against Russell Faria. Joel Schwartz worked hard to appeal Russ's conviction and became convinced that Pamela Hopp was a murderer. Pam had made a comment during the first trial that her mother had recently died of Alzheimer's disease. This is the same mother she suggested to police she would have killed if she wanted money instead of Betsy. However, Shirley Newman did not die from Alzheimer's disease. She fell from a third-story balcony at her assisted living home on October 31, 2013. By this time, Dateline producers had begun to cover this story and work with the defense to get to the bottom of this crazy story. Dateline hired an engineer to recreate Pam's mother's fall. Three of the spindles on the balcony had been completely broken out, which engineers said would have required nearly 2,000 pounds of force. It didn't seem likely that an elderly woman fell through them to her death. On the day before Shirley's body was found Pam had picked her mother up and taken her to the hospital for back pain. Pam brought her mother back and upon leaving informed staff her mother would not be down for breakfast the next day, and maybe not even lunch. A housekeeper came to check on Shirley the next day and found her body lying on the ground beneath the balcony. Police ruled the death accidental. Pam's brother initially filed a lawsuit against the facility and manufacturer of the railing, but he later dropped the suit. Pam received a large amount of money from her mother's life insurance policies. In 2015, Russell Faria's conviction was overturned thanks in part to the ridiculous rulings by Judge Christina Menemeyer. This time, Russ would have the opportunity to present a real defense and point the finger back at Pam Hupp. Leah Askey was determined to retry Russell and get another conviction, but this time she wasn't going to call her star witness Pamela Hupp. Pam had continued to change her story, refused to give Betsy's daughters any money, and had proven herself an unreliable witness. However, Leah Askey found the mysterious letter Pam told her about shortly after Betsy's death. The letter, which stated she was scared of Russ and thought he was trying to hurt her, was found in a document on Betsy's computer. However, it was the only document on the laptop that was by an unknown author, was loaded through Outlook Mail which Betsy did not use, and was created by Windows 97, which was never installed on Betsy's computer. Joel Schwartz believed that Pam Hupp wrote this email and downloaded it to Betsy's computer four days before her death, the same day Betsy changed the insurance beneficiary. Or did she? Pam had been fired from more than one job for forgery. Before Russ's second trial, Pam Hupp told police that she and Betsy were lovers and that was why Betsy made her the beneficiary. Her stories grew more and more bizarre as time went on. Pam was anything but predictable. She also claimed Russ had threatened to kill her sometime before the murder. None of this came up until his original conviction was overturned. This time, the defense also had new evidence. They had found the pictures that were taken of the luminal reactions. The police officers and Leah Askey had claimed they were not developed correctly due to a mechanical error on the camera, but they had developed. The only problem is, they didn't show any luminal reactions at all. The investigators had committed perjury in the first trial. Leah Askey claimed not to have knowledge of this. For his second trial, Russ opted for a bench trial. This meant no jury, but just a judge would determine his fate. Christina Menemeyer was not to be that judge, and instead, a more experienced and unbiased judge took the stand. After days of testimony and review of all the evidence, including everything that pointed to Pamela up, Russell Faria was acquitted on all charges. He was finally a free man after four years in prison for a crime he could not have committed. On August 16, 2016, a 911 call came in from the home of Pamela Up. She explained in an oddly calm manner that a man had broken into her house. She can be heard yelling at him and then five shots were fired. Upon arrival to her O'Fallon, Missouri home, the body of 33-year-old Louis Gumpenberger was found lying on the floor in Pam's hallway. Pam explained the man attacked her in the garage and tried to kidnap her. She claimed she shot him in self-defense. 
Inside Louis Gumpenberger's pocket was a handwritten note with instructions to kidnap Pam, get Russ's money, and kill Pam. It even referenced making it look like Betsy's death, suggesting the man was responsible for both. Pam said she thought she saw the man get dropped off by Russell Faria. Russ was called in for questioning but had a rock-solid alibi and was cleared of any wrongdoing. Police investigated Louis Gumpenberger and learned that he was in an automobile accident in 2005 and sustained head trauma. He was left partially disabled and would not have been able to chase Pam as she told police. In fact, his left arm was paralyzed. Pam also claimed to be firing the shots with both hands, but she was holding the phone with 911 when the shots were fired. She told police she walked towards the man while she shot him, which didn't match a self-defense shooting. Strangely enough, they also found a strip of carpet underneath Gumpenberger's body, almost as if to protect the home's regular carpet. DST Charles police were not as trusting of Pam as the Lincoln County investigators had been in 2011. A witness from Lewis's neighborhood came forward and said that she had been picked up by a woman matching Pam's description a week before Lewis was killed. The woman, who she positively identified as Pamela Up, told her she was a producer for Dateline and would pay the woman $1,000 to reenact a 911 call. That's odd since Lewis Gumpenberger had $900 in crisp $100 bills in his pocket when he was killed. Police found $100 bills in Pam's home that had sequential serial numbers to those found on Louis Gumpenberger. Pamela Opp was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. St. Charles prosecutors believed her motive was to frame Russell Faria, again, and take the suspicion off herself in the Betsy Faria case. They believed that Pamela Opp, whose vehicle was recorded on the star witness's security cameras, drove to the neighborhood to find someone who needed money. She tried to pick up Terrell, the first person she approached, but Terrell thought it was odd and refused to go with Pam. A week later she returned and picked up Louis Gumpenberger, promising him $1,000 to reenact a 911 call for Dateline. She gave Louis $900 in bills and had the sequential bills in her home, making it very unlikely Louis got the money somewhere else. Cell phone records prove Pam Hop picked a man up in his neighborhood and came straight back to her house just minutes before the 911 call. In what he believed to be pretend, Pamela Hop called 911 and shot Louis Gumpenberger five times, causing his death. While in police custody, Pam slipped a pen into her back pocket. She went to the bathroom and stabbed herself over and over in the wrists and neck. She was treated at a local hospital and sent back to jail with minor injuries only. In her mugshot, now famous, she has bulky gauze on both sides of her neck that looked like maxi pads. St. Charles State's attorney could have sought the death penalty, but Pamela Opp agreed to take an Alfred plea in exchange for life in prison without parole. On July 12, 2021, Lincoln County Prosecutor Mike Wood, who defeated Leah Askey in the election following Russell's acquittal, charged Pamela Opp with first-degree murder and armed criminal action for the 2011 death of Betsy Faria. He also vowed to investigate Leah Askey and the Lincoln County investigators involved in the original investigation. Mike Wood is seeking the death penalty against Pamela Opp. Christina Menemeyer has faced disciplinary actions and investigations related to some of her rulings in other cases. Leah Askey was voted out of office and replaced by Mike Wood as Lincoln County State's attorney. She denies any misconduct in the case against Russell Faria and says getting the conviction was the worst thing that ever happened to her. Russell moved on, ironically with Terrell, the woman Pam Hopp tried to pick up before Louis Gumpenberger. He successfully sued Lincoln County for his wrongful conviction. Pamela Opp is in prison where she will remain for the rest of her life. Her life may get cut short if she is convicted of killing Betsy Faria. Mark Hopp divorced Pam after her conviction. Pamela Opp was greedy and murdered for money. Many people believe she murdered Betsy, her own mother, and Louis Gumpenberger. These same people believe that if Lincoln County had conducted a proper investigation in 2011, Shirley Newman and Louis Gumpenberger would likely still be alive. Instead, they let Pam remain free to play deadly games. As we conclude our exploration of these two haunting stories, we are left with more questions than answers. 
Rachel Timmerman's tale serves as a reminder of how easily lives can be derailed by secrets and betrayal, leaving us pondering the true nature of events and the enduring impact on those involved. Meanwhile, the mysterious deaths of Betsy Faria and the bewildering case of Louis Gumpenberger leave us questioning the limits of justice and the complexity of human motives. These stories remind us that the search for truth is often elusive, and the pursuit of justice is a complex and ever-evolving journey. They serve as a reminder to remain vigilant, to question, and to seek a deeper understanding of the stories that unfold around us. Join us again for more captivating tales that explore the depths of the human psyche and the intricate tapestry of the human experience. Until then, may these stories continue to provoke thought and reflection long after the video ends.